morning, everyone from Washington, D.C. I'm Amanda Glassman. I'm the Executive Vice President here at the Center for Global Development and a Senior Fellow. We're really excited to welcome you to this panel this morning. Um, some administrative details first. Uh, we'll have our panel uh, give their comments, and then we'll turn to questions from you, our audience, that we'll take on Twitter, at CGDEV, hashtag CGD Talks. You can put your questions or comments below the YouTube feed, or you can send your questions to us by email at events at cgdev.org. We're talking about cash transfers for COVID-19 response today for two reasons. First, because the global economic shock is profoundly affecting low and middle income country economies and jobs. This week, the International Monetary Fund forecasts negative growth around the world into 2021 under somewhat optimistic assumptions. And the World Bank is projecting substantial increases in poverty in South Asia, Latin America, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Informal workers in the service sector, like hospitality, retail trade, transport, all of this uh, is, is faring very poorly, and they also have very limited or no access to health care and safety nets. The second reason we're talking about cash transfers today is because the policy measures, or as we in the health sector call them, the non-pharmaceutical interventions to attack COVID-19, the lockdowns, social distancing, isolating vulnerable people, these measures are particularly difficult to implement in low- and middle-income countries, where upwards of 60 to 80 percent of the workforce is informal, meaning that no work means no pay, means a hard hit to household to consumption. So if people also need to stay home or care for themselves or family members while ill, they may need to be compensated. Are cash transfers a tool to do this as well? There are also some troubling signs of localized food price increases that will affect the ability of poor families and individuals to buy food. So what should governments and their development partners do to respond to this evolving situation? I would first say that cash transfers are a big part of the routine safety net in many countries to start. There are pro these are programs that transfer either a routine or a lump sum of cash to poor households or to households with vulnerable members, families with children, orphans, elderly families without pensions. Um, they can be relatively large in coverage. In some Latin American countries, up to a fifth of the population, uh, some few in universal schemes, but in many places, cash transfer programs are still quite small in size. And these programs generally coexist with other kinds of subsidies from government. Uh, some that are less efficient or even regressive, like fuel subsidies, or others that are more efficient, like school feeding programs. But the impact of these well-evaluated programs, cash transfers, is clear that they do help with and smooth household consumption, particularly during shocks. Um, and they can also help with other kinds of development outcomes, like healthcare seeking, asset accumulation, gender-based violence, sometimes nutrition, among others. Depends on the program. The other reason why we're talking about it today is because non-governmental organizations also are starting to work more broadly with cash transfers. Today we have um, a colleague from Give Directly, which is a non-governmental organization that has worked in Kenya and Rwanda and other places in sub-Saharan Africa. These are also very well-evaluated programs. There are some small-scale results in Rwanda, for example, that show significant drops in infant mortality as a result of a transfer. And we're also seeing more cash as part of humanitarian response. So the question to the panel today is, where are we with cash transfers in terms of the response to COVID? And how useful could they be to the health and economic response? And could they be scaled up much further? So we'll start with um, our panel today, which includes Ugo Gentilini from the World Bank. Uh, he's written an incredible book uh, that looks at universal basic income and cash transfers around the world and their design. Um, and he's also keeping track online of all of these programs in response to COVID-19 in a live document that we'll share afterwards on the blog. So let's turn first to Ugo to hear his view. Thanks. Um, thank you, Amanda. Um, well, clearly there has been uh, an explosion of action in social protection over the past few weeks. Uh, with uh, cash transfers being the cornerstone of that response. 
Um, as of today, a total of 126 countries have introduced or adapted social protection and jobs programs in response to COVID, um, and including uh, more than 500 different measures. Uh, and uh, those measures for social assistance now reach uh, over 600 million people, um, and about one third of those measures are cash transfers. Uh, so they have been used uh, uh, with as part of new programs introduced as part of the response, but also in scaling up existing schemes, providing more generous benefits, um, but also um, have been their, their delivery has been simplified to enhance the speed of response in a number of cases. Um, but if we step back a second, uh, the use of cash transfers in the pandemic uh, is not only helping to respond to immediate needs, but also sheds light on some long-standing challenges and provides an opportunity to innovate. So uh, I'll, I'd like just to highlight uh, three key areas uh, that are widely discussed uh, these days. And one relates to uh, the so-called miss the middle or how to cover with cash transfers in formal workers um, and there are about 2 billion of them out there. And uh, so the basic challenge is how to reach them where they are not included in uh, national social registries. They are too poor to afford social insurance, but also not poor enough for qualifying uh, to social assistance. And what we see that uh, what countries are doing now is that they are complementing uh, social registries with new online platforms like uh, like Brazil or Thailand that is reaching 9 million people in that way, or Morocco that is tapping the health sector information uh, and providing cash transfers through that mechanism to about 3 million informal workers, or Colombia where its national registries um, is, uh, is used in tandem with the tax collection information and the solidarity income program reaches about 3 million people. And, you know, cash transfers uh, provided to informal workers, we estimated are quite sizable, about over half of monthly median income, and they're temporary, which emphasizes the need for strong communication, making sure that it's really understood that those transfers are temporary and related to, um, um, to the corona crisis. And we have seen many videos in Colombia and Morocco explaining to the population uh, how to apply and how those programs work. Another big area that is emerging is how to adapt programs to urban areas. The, mass, the vast majority of cash transfers are rural and there is nascent experience in urban areas. I'm aware of eight countries in Africa and about other 20 globally that are trying to adapt to urban, um, urban areas. And this means also rethinking how to outreach to people, thinking what is the concept of community, um, having benefit structures, uh, that uh, are attractive to people that have highly dynamic livelihoods, making benefits portable, working in high crime neighborhoods, problems of homelessness, violence and substance abuse, um, and also how to integrate social protection with urban development plans, how to work in informal settlements and slum upgrading programs. So we see this is a nascent area, some, uh, some experience coming up, but much more will be needed moving forward. Another area uh, much debated is whether programs introduced in the crisis will actually stay on after the crisis. Um, and uh, I think that a number of countries, as mentioned, are simplifying their design and delivery of programs, like conditional cash transfers have been waiving their conditions, like in the Philippines or Italy, or public works waive the work requirements. India's state of Uttar Pradesh is providing unconditional payments to Nrega workers, about 30 million um, participants. But some countries have taken it all the way to simply provide cash transfers to the entire adult population on a one-off basis. That's uh, Serbia, Hong Kong, and Singapore. And on one hand, this has created an interesting convergence uh, between monetary and fiscal policy around cash transfers. So a new way of looking at, uh, at a universal basic income as a crisis response platform, a narrative that wasn't there before. But on the other hand, also a temporary transfer is not a UBI, but it's helicopter money. And uh, helicopter money is a top up uh, uh, program. Um, UBI is a permanent one. So if helicopter money is going to transition to a UBI, it will need to address a number of choices and trade offs on, on how, to, how it fits in social protection systems.
So a lot going on, but there is, as you said, Amanda, uh, space to do much more. Um, I mentioned the missing middle, but there is also a massive hole in coverage in people at the very bottom of the distribution. In low-income countries, about 90% of people in the poorest quintile receive no transfer at all. And about over 40% of the poorest quintile in lower middle income countries is uncovered. And there are many bottlenecks to expand coverage. I would just say a few words on three of them, on financing institutions and delivery. On financing, countries are spending more and spending has grown, uh, but low income countries and middle income countries spend about 1.5% of GDP on social assistance. What does that mean in absolute term in low income countries? Uh, basically, the budget of a hospital in Sweden is nine times higher than the entire social protection budget in a typical low-income countries country. And financing also is largely external. Uh, in Africa, for example, the share of domestic financing is less than half in, in 17 out of 31 countries assessed in, uh, in a recent analysis. In terms of institutions, just some words on, on the importance of crisis preparedness. For social protection, the internal coordination with disaster risk management authority is key for scalable systems, including ensuring that programs are served by early warning systems, triggers, there are triggers for scalability, there are predefined operational protocols uh, for who to reach and how to do so. So, and we, we have seen in the past crisis that where countries have those uh, shock responsive features, Scale up time can be much faster. Estimates by Bedley and, and Barca show that when a drought hit Kenya in 2016, it took two weeks to scale up and make payments. In places lacking those scalable arrangements, it took up to four months. Um, and in terms of external institutional coordination, as you said, Amanda, humanitarian assistance has been a key supplement to government capacities and often led the ground war for national safety nets like in Ethiopia and Mauritania but only 2.5% of humanitarian assistance is channeled via government structures. Sometimes it makes sense to go parallel, but this should be the exception and not the rule, and the default should be using government systems. So there is a big agenda on assuring that humanitarian systems and, and government systems are well aligned. Um, and finally, on, on delivery, I think we are witnessing game-changing innovations in uh, identification, digital payments, financial inclusion, all of which are really revolutionizing cash transfers, delivering, uh, allowing for more transparency, accountability, um, empowerment, efficiency, really move the delivery frontier uh, somewhat exponentially. But there is lots of work ahead and many places are far from mission accomplished. Uh, I love the recent paper by Galben uh, Mukherjee and Navis at CGD. And they, they show that um, uh, national IDs uh, uh, have wide coverage in a number of, uh, of uh, uh, in almost all regions. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is around 70%, so about one third doesn't have it of the population. In terms of financial uh, accounts, uh, about half of the population in Latin America and Caribbean has a, a bank account. Uh, less than half in Sub-Saharan Africa. In Middle East and North Africa, it's about one third. Um, and also when it comes to mobile phones, um, countries like Kenya have made enormous progress, uh, but still on average, the region is about 60% covered, uh, you know, those that own a mobile phone, less than 70% in South Asia. So um, a lot of promising innovation, but also a lot to still do to make sure that delivery systems really reach the entire population. And that is key both for immediate relief response, but also for longer term systems development in social protection. I'll stop here. Thank you, Ugo. Really interesting. And uh, also to say, you mentioned um, that much of the humanitarian cash effort goes through parallel structures, but also to say that still only about 10 percent of humanitarian assistance is in the form of cash, according to the Cash Learning Partnership. Um, so there's also space to increase that share, especially as we operate in this context. So uh, let's now go to Laura Alfers. She's the director of the Social Protection Program at WeGo, Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing. And she'll talk to us more about the problem of informal workers, whether they're covered by these routine programs, can we scale up, um, and, and generally share her viewpoint. Thanks, Laura, for joining us from South Africa.
Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Um, and just to say, I mean, both Amanda and Ugo have mentioned the issue of informality um, and perhaps to give a few more details on who these workers are. In low income countries, informal workers make up 90% of the workers, so very high, high, work, high level, and much lower in middle income countries is 67%. 72% of these workers are self employed in low income countries, so high levels of self employment. Many are poor, but not poor enough to qualify for existing cash transfer programs, um, so falling into that, that idea of the missing middle. And women are overrepresented amongst the poorest. Of workers, and I think it's important to to um, highlight that gender segmentation that happens in the informal economy. Many of the, these workers have very suddenly lost their incomes before the health crisis has hit. In many developing cr cr countries, it's actually the economic crisis that has hit first. Domestic workers have been laid off. Street vendors and waste pickers have been banned from working in public spaces. Home workers working in garment supply chains suddenly have no orders coming from Europe and China. For these workers, there's no employer, no insurance fund, no safety net, and no savings to fall back on. At least partial replacement of income through the state is therefore critical to their survival at this moment in time. And what's been interesting for us um, as a network of membership-based organizations in the informal economy is that we're seeing a sudden groundswell of support for the idea of cash transfers. And that's true from worker organizations in Zimbabwe to Brazil to Colombia to South Africa to India. And it's notable because previously we haven't, within WeGo, seen a trend towards a focus on cash transfers, advocacy towards cash transfers. And perhaps for two reasons. Informal workers have never been the target of cash transfer policies as a group, right? They're either targeted at the very poor or those who fall outside of the labor market, the old, the very young, and so on. So the policy space has not been there. And I think now we are seeing the policy space open, and so, so workers are responding to that as well. Um, second, I think it's also important to understand that for informal workers in the informal economy, the, the, the emphasis has been on protecting incomes through improving their livelihoods in the informal economy. For them, that has been the first prize, is to have better incomes through the work that they do, have that work recognized, supported, and protected. And I think that's an important point to recognize as we start talking about complements to cash transfers um, as well. I think for informal workers in particular, the, the priority is that cash transfer programs that are now very narrowly targeted at the very poor or um, at those outside of the labor market need to extend further if they're going to cover informal workers. They need to go beyond to beyond that um, in terms of both horizontal coverage, um, but, but also perhaps in, in um, amount as well. Um, and, and Oxfam has said that the battle against poverty, they've just released a report, um, is likely to be set back 20 years. And a lot of those people, a lot of those gains are going to be lost in the informal economy. It's those informal workers who have managed to stay out of poverty through the work they do. It is they, they who are going to be the first group that fall back into poverty. So I think shifting the emphasis from targeting the very poor now to those who are going to be very poor very soon um, needs to be the emphasis. And Ugo has, has given a few really good examples of how some governments are starting to respond. I would say one issue that we are starting to experience just in terms of engaging with, with governments is that lots of time is being spent on working out how to target informal workers specifically. And this is, this is um, a problem in countries where it's be, you know, there, there are no data systems that capture informal workers, either in the current social insurance systems or in the, in the cash transfer systems. Um, and instead of taking wider approaches, saying let's just go for a universal grant or perhaps let's target out um, and try and capture informal workers that way by targeting out formal workers and targeting out those who already receive cash transfers, you know, a lot of, a lot, a lot of thought is going to, well, you know, that's going to be too expensive. And, and while I don't want to say that cost is not a constraint, cost is always going to be a constraint, particularly in low-income countries. I would like to see more attempts to weigh up the direct costs of, of more expansive grants, um, say that target out rather than looking to target in, 
uh, with the indirect costs of what targeting is going to entail in terms of administrative and time costs, and perhaps even the cost of the inability to act timeously enough. Um, and I think my, my last point, and it's perhaps the, the, the most important one, is just to say that these income support measures that are reaching informal workers are to absolutely be applauded and be encouraged and to say that we need more of them around the world. Uh, it's a matter of survival for many informal workers. But what we're also recognizing is that the incomes of informal workers are probably not going to be coming back anytime soon. A lot of the measures that are being put in place at the moment are short-term measures, ranging from one-off payments to, you know, uh, six months. Um, if we think, for example, of street traders in Southeast Asia who rely on tourism, uh, garment workers who rely on, you know, clothing orders from Europe, um, on home-based workers who produce craft products for the tourist industry in Asia, I think it's going to take a long time for those industries to recover. Uh, it's not months, perhaps it's years. Um, and, and I think that, that we need to start thinking longer term and medium term um, about these social protection programs that are being put in place. I think there, there are two implications of this. Um, cash transfers and livelihood recovery need to be seen together. Uh, I, I think it's really important that support for informal workers does not stop at cash transfers. And, and I, think, I think that sometimes does happen. We'll deal with the informal economy by giving them a cash transfer, and then the macroeconomic stimulus package is going to focus on the formal economy. I think it's really important that if we are providing income support for informal workers, we're also thinking about how we recover livelihoods in – recover and protect livelihoods in the informal economy. And, and one of those is going to be for governments and international institutions to help protect the market position that informal workers currently occupy. I mean, we have a very scary story from Colombia where waste picker cooperatives of waste reclaimers who have received municipal contracts for the work they do are not wanting to leave the streets, even if there is social protection in place, because they worry that private waste management companies will take up those contracts that they have spent years fighting for. So, so that is what I mean by the need to protect the market position of informal workers as well as provide social protection. And then I think the second, second point is that we really should be in building these emergency responses now, and as, as Ugo has already said, we need to be thinking about how do these become sustainable social protection systems in the long term that actually cover informal workers. Um, it, it may move beyond cash transfers alone, for sure, but, but that non-contributory component of social protection is going to be really important for a lot of informal workers. Uh, and it needs to be done. We cannot go on with 61% of the world wor world's workers not having access to social protection. Thank you. I'll end there. Thank you, Laura. That was really important points that you've made, um, and, and particularly about the decisions that we make now need to be in place for some time um, and need to consider uh, the overall macro environment as well. Okay, let's now um, go to Joe Houston, who's the Managing Director at Give Directly, which is a U.S.-based non-governmental organization, but that has worked in the area of cash transfers for the past five or more years, probably more, 10 years? 10 years. Okay, so let's turn it over to Joe, who knows what he's talking about. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda, and thanks, Ugo and Laura. Um, and so I'll give a bit of background on Give Directly and then talk a little bit about what we've learned from some of the past research we've done on cash transfers over the last 10 years or so, uh, how we've had to adapt our programs in response to COVID-19. And uh, I'll end with a, a hope uh, for changes that I, I think uh, could be permanent uh, post COVID-19. Um, so the quick background on GiveDirectly is we've delivered about $150 million across seven countries in Africa uh, with uh, more limited projects in the U.S. and the Bahamas. Uh, we're a nonprofit, and so we receive funds from private individuals, foundations, bilateral and multilateral funders, sign people up to receive cash, pay them, mostly through mobile money, and then confirm receipt and manage issues through call centers in the places where we work. Uh, 
typically when we get to choose, we sign, we choose poor, mostly rural communities and sign everybody up to participate. Uh, but we've also done programs specifically targeting young people uh, for youth empowerment issues, mothers of young children for nutrition issues, people living in refugee settlements, uh, and people recovering from disasters. Um, in parallel, and I think uh, in uh, something that's relevant for this conversation is we're often conducting research. And so we've got uh, 13 randomized controlled trials underway or completed, uh, one looking at uh, uh, sort of large-scale test of a universal basic income in Kenya, a few studies looking at cash benchmarking with USAID, uh, and a study in Kenya that recently came out on the kind of general equilibrium or more macroeconomic effects uh, of cash transfers. Um, and I think especially in conversations with this where you know, directly uh, is not even really a this at the size of a small government program uh, and, and certainly not the, the size of the government, the sort of total government response required in this case, uh, hopefully, I think we can be a useful design lab or, or case study in, in the delivery of cash transfers. And so um, I, I think that's a place where we can be helpful here. Um, and then the headline with COVID-19 is that we've had to convert an operation that was mostly door-to-door -door, uh, into one that is more remote or at least very safely low contact uh, and uh, focus on payments that can be helpful uh, in, in response to the pandemic. And so we've started getting payments out in, in Kenya this week. Um, and so with that, I, I wanted to share a few things we've learned from the research and, and experience we've had, um, and these are intentionally very general, but uh, I think helpful here. Um, and I'll start with the caveats. I think these are pretty different times that, uh, especially with uh, that none of our studies sort of were through a pandemic. Uh, none of our, our, most of our experience is not even through uh, very extreme income shocks. And so I do think, uh, what we will learn in this period will be helpful, uh, both on the sort of give directly and then globally from cash transfers. The research we do now will uh, kind of better build out the picture of how cash can be helpful here. Uh, but a few things I'd emphasize are, one, um, cash is versatile uh, and it enables a variety of choices. And so we've been given cash in a variety of sizes to a wide variety of people uh, in a diverse set of contexts. And I think the consistent thing you see is that uh, you can successfully get cash to people, and those people can pr put it towards productive uses, um, whether that is a, a graduation out of poverty or a bunch of other, you know, there's a bunch of questions about the sort of limits of those effects. But uh, I, I do think it's clear that uh, people, when given cash, uh, can put that cash towards their top priorities or, or big needs. Um, and in particular, uh, cash can affect some of the indicators you might care, especially about in these types of cases, whether it's uh, food security or debt or, or more psychological measures like stress or intimate partner violence that uh, we have seen examples of um, cash sort of engaging with those types of effects. And so, I don't know, in a time when we're seeing news about stress rates increasing, uh, intimate partner violence increasing, uh, I think there's a question about cash's role in, in things like that. Um, and the last point I would highlight on, on what we've learned is that Cash, by its very nature, is interactive. Um, and GiveDirectly has studied this from a few different angles, whether it's uh, sort of looking at the kind of, quote, spillovers of cash or the macroeconomic effects of cash. Uh, and, and sometimes this conversation is framed, including by GiveDirectly, as does cash have spillovers, uh, when it necessarily must, that the point of cash is to give somebody value and enable them to transact. Um, and I think that has important implications for how we view cash's role in a pandemic. Um, there's the market effects side of it, where um, in well-functioning markets, uh, it can be a helpful way to have cash recirculating through local economies, uh, potentially now, but also potentially later uh, as a stimulus measure. Um, there's also in less well-functioning markets or in examples of less well-implemented targeting, uh, the risk that you make things worse, that, uh, um, because of a economic shutdown or things like that, that uh, the market isn't ready for a, a large cash infusion. And so I think combining those, at least doing that assessment and sort of thinking through what type of market you're uh, sending a lot of demand towards is important. Um, another aspect of cash being interactive that I think is relatively uh, new for this period, uh, especially for a disease that's so uh, high infectious and low symptom early on, is uh, the dynamics of in-person cash outs that 
an effect of paying people a lot of money, usually remotely, is that you send them to cash out uh, in market centers or in uh, banks or mobile money agents or things like that. And I think that especially matters for as you think about different the payments landscapes that different countries have, how concentrated those places will be, um, as well as how to compare those types of uh, through cash out or liquidity events with other aid distribution events. Uh, you know, uh, we, we saw in, in in Kenya this week uh, that uh, in kind aid is, has its own risks in terms of managing distribution, both from a contagious risk and also just a, a, a sort of uh, crowd management risk as well. And so, but, but, but I think that that's a question for cash transfers as well. Um, I did want to give a sense of, of how we've been adapting our programs in response to COVID-19. Uh, the most obvious one is that targeting enrollment ha has had to change for us, that mo typically our model involves choosing a kind of geographic boundary and within that boundary going door to door and conducting a series of in-person interviews, collecting digital data, and passing people through our system that way. Um, obviously, the, the stakes of doing something like that are a lot higher, and so we've paused basically all of our in-person operations currently, um, and are exploring more remote ways to sign people up. Uh, in, in some cases, that's turning what was an in-person survey later on in the enrollment process into a phone one. Uh, and we've got uh, our team basically all sitting in their homes calling people all day these days, uh, either to sign people up for cash or to deal with their issues. Uh, in others, I think it involves partnerships with groups or organizations that already uh, have contact with low-income people or vulnerable people. Um, some of the examples of that that we're exploring, uh, even before COVID-19, we were planning a pilot test with a, a major telco provider in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, to sort of use the data they have to identify vulnerable folks you know, whether it's by how they buy all minutes or data, whether they call others or whether they're called, things like that, uh, and then enroll people and pay them uh, entirely remotely. That was going to be a kind of skunk works, very tiny pilot uh, uh, earlier this year, and I think now uh, will be a, a much bigger way that we find people up this year. Um, another example is partnerships with nonprofits, especially those that might work with uh, groups of people that are likely to be left out. And so uh, the first cash we've gotten out in Kenya is with uh, a, a nonprofit that works in in uh, a slum in Nairobi and ha already has a network of people they've identified as vulnerable pre-COVID-19. Um, I think the other thing that we've that's been clear to us is obviously COVID-19 emphasizes the value of digital identification and payment systems that uh, uh, I think the kind of more in-person elements of those things will uh, be, you know, I think will really suffer at this time. And then as Ugo mentioned, I, I think platforms uh, on the nonprofit side, maybe it's partnerships with things like MTN, and on the government side, I think it's uh, citizen identification or resident identification, and then platforms to sort of identify people and then scale and deliver need are, are absolutely critical. Um, and, and then as other folks have mentioned as well, decoupling those platforms from legal status, whether it's refugees or undocumented people or informal folks, folks so that you do have uh, verifiable data on who people are within a certain geography and, and how you can reach them. Uh, on payment sizes, this one may be obvious, but I, I think our programs and many cash programs likely will shift from uh, asset transfer based models to kind of more emergency UBI or emerging re emergency recurring payment models. And so we're giving about 30 to $50 for households for a few months in a row. Um, and then on the call center service front, we've gone from having uh, call centers in, in each of the capital cities to people at home uh, getting airtime topped up remotely and calling folks all day in, in their homes. Um, and so that all said, I'll, I'll end with a, a kind of hope for uh, what could come out of uh, COVID-19 longer term. Um, and there's been lots of talk about this, whether it's uh, on the sort of sillier end about maybe we'll work from home more, uh, be more germ conscious, maybe we're better prepared for the next pandemic. Uh, on the GD end, our New York office rent is looking a bit silly uh, as it sits uh, totally unused. Um, but I think something that's interesting is that because of the aspects of this pandemic, uh, for many funders, this will be the most cash relief they've ever given, or certainly as a proportion of their giving portfolios. 
Uh, and I hope that that changes the default in a helpful way that uh, as they sort of move on to kind of future years and think about their giving, uh, it's a sort of new type of cash benchmark where uh, as they sort of switch back to normal programming, they look program by program and say, yep, I think that one's better than cash transfers. We should scale it up or no, I think this one should actually, uh, we should just give the budget to the people we're trying to help. And so that's uh, the hopeful note of what I love to see come out of uh, what, what's been a horrible disease. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Uh, also for grounding our conversation in, in the real world um, implementation challenges that your program is facing. So uh, now I'll turn to my colleague, uh, Senior Policy Fellow Jude Moore, who is formerly Minister of Public Works in Liberia <laughs> and also saw the Ebola response uh, there, so he'll he'll have his own perspective. But Jude and I are hatching a call where we would like to see cash as a big part of the international response and called out that way. But tell us, Jude, uh, your thoughts on this issue. Sure, sure. Thank you, Amanda, again. Thanks to Joe, Laura, and Hugo. Um, so if anyone, if for, for those of us who've been following Hugo's work and his, you know, daily uptake in terms of the expansion of cash transfer programs, we've seen that there does appears to be no real debate about the suitability of cash transfer as the preferred policy intervention in a crisis like this. So as he said, 126 countries, over 500 programs, um, a third of which, you know, are direct cash transfers. So I guess it, for me, it makes sense to move to the next item on the agenda, which is basically the size, the scale, and the scope, especially uh, um, in, in, this, uh, in this outbreak. One of the things that we've seen is even across the continent of Africa, a, a cash transfers now you know, ha, have become the go-to uh, um, policy mechanism, with so much so that the president of Togo did an op-ed in the Financial Times talking about a new cash transfer program they've done and encouraging his counterparts to do the same thing. Obviously, there's a little question about the Togo this one because they're tying it to voter registration especially because the opposition sat out the last election. So it was sort of, sort of seen as a means of punishing those who didn't turn out to vote. But that's uh, another issue. Um, I, <clears throat> the question then is about uh, um, how big should it be and how, how, how big of, of uh, a proportion of the, the response, the current response, um, it should be. First, we saw that G20 leaders uh, promised to infuse about $5 trillion dollars in, in the economy in terms of being able to do everything that is needed. So that is the scale of what is going on in the rest of the world. And, and even here in the U.S., it was a $2 trillion stimulus, of which 30% was direct cash transfers um, to people, either in the form of the stimulus checks or uh, uh, unemployment benefits. So from the, the way I wanted to look at this was uh, when I was at the Ministry of Public Works and we did a big civil works project, sometimes we would uh, encroach on private property. And when we encroached on private property, um, it's eminent domain, where we converted a private asset to public use, we would compensate the owner of the private, the private property. We didn't compensate them in terms of fair market value. What we compensated was just compensation, right? So people have been asked to stay home. They, their private asset, which is the labor, going out to be able to make a living, they've been asked to stay at home. It's almost as if the government has, has appropriated for a public good, which is public health, and ask people to stay home. So the compensation to people for the, for, for the cost of staying home is what we get in these stimulus checks, is what we get uh, across the world in terms of what governments are doing. Now, across uh, sub-Saharan Africa, between, I mean, up to 80% of the work, the labor force is in the informal sector. And when you ask them to stay home, exercise eminent domain on their labor, what is the compensation that's available for them? And what should the size of that compensation be? And so I simply went by the U.S. package to say at least 30 percent of the economic in intervention should be direct cash payments. Obviously, we're going to run into the, the question of the mechanism of delivering that, but I don't want to focus on that for the moment. I want to focus on the size of that. Of that 30%, I'm thinking about 24% of that is to the informal sector because that's, you were talking about economies that are largely agrarian, rural, and like I said, informal. 
And what we've seen, if you look at the IMF website and the running tally of policy interventions that even African countries have done, they've targeted the formal sector, which is really, really small. So I'm thinking 25, 24% of direct cash transfers in terms of the economic intervention will go to the informal sector. And then that 5% we can actually use. So, so in places where it's government workers, it's firms that actually pay taxes. So <clears throat> uh, firms that actually pay taxes and we can be able to uh, um, cover the, the um the formal sector with that. Well, why, why, why is this important? I think um, when we step back for a minute, the conversations about trans cash transfers have always focused on vulnerable populations, poor or, or, or people who are old. But I think we should, we, we should actually think about cash transfers. We're talking about a continent where investment in um, social services chronically low. So it means that the baseline from which people are coming is already low and less resilient to, and, and to any shock, especially a shock like this one that forces people to stay at home. So 30% uh, of, of, of this. And how do we get to this 30%? Well, for, first of all, there is a big push, and we at the Center for Global Development have been a part of that in terms of uh, a standstill mechanism or a suspension of interest payments on loans from developing countries, poor countries, and, and so yesterday, Mozambique announced that they were going to use their uh, uh, what money they accrued from the suspension of interest payments to the COVID response. They didn't say how much of that. So definitely some of that money is going to go to um, extra spending in the health sector because there's a health crisis. But I think 30 percent of all of the economic um, uh, um, packages available should be dedicated to what cash transfer. We can talk about the next stage, and that's about the mechanism of delivery, because most of the systems uh, across sub-Saharan Africa are undeveloped. Most of them have not really transitioned from a pilot scale to a full scale, and therefore the mechanism of being able to target and deliver that does not exist. But I think if we agree on the scale and the question, we can definitely move to the next step. Because a part of the thing about cash transfer is that it allows us to achieve ancillary development objectives. So, for example, financial inclusion, because we have these tools to be able to, to develop, to, to deliver. I think cash transfer, especially in this case, is superior to other forms, especially, say, in kind. Um, for the same reason that the government of Denmark is going to pay and the government of South Korea is going to pay up to 75 percent of the salaries of people who are even laid off and sent home but not taken off the payroll. Because what it does is that at the end of the outbreak, companies, even small companies, do not have to recruit. The people can simply come back to work and the economy can pick up from where it left off. When we do in-kind um, uh, contributions, um, it means that local vendors, local supply chains are disrupted, and because they're already from a very, very low base, some of them may never return. And if we're trying to keep a semblance of the economy working, then cash transfer provides, obviously, it doesn't, it's not universally applicable, and we should be able to test to see in business where it actually does apply. What, what can we look for in terms of uh, bilateral partners to be able to help? One of the things that I think is important is that the mechanism of, trans, uh, of transmission. So, uh, in Liberia, in Ghana, the central bank has suspended the tariffs on, tra on cash transfers, but that's not sustainable in the long run because the telecom, telecom companies require that th those tariffs to continue to remain op um, operational and profitable. So I think part of the response from development partners should be to cover some of the tariffs for the cash transfers, especially if we go digital, to be able to do that. The second thing also is unity in purpose. When I was Minister of Public Works, one of the problems we had was there was a reform and African Development Bank was paying for a reform. USAID was paying for a reform. CEDA was paying for a reform. They were doing the exact same reform. Reform. It was duplicative. It was wasteful. It accomplished nothing. And if we go about in in a crisis like this, where there, you know, significant crisis with low in terms of resource base, instead of duplicative. Uh, partner interventions, if we intend to do uh, um, cash transfers, one would hope that all of the partners would, would act as one in terms of being able to deliver this. So I think going back to uh, Amanda and I and, and some of our colleagues at the Center for Global Development are working on this in terms of how big a cash transfer should be. And the final thing I would say is that we know that this pandemic is not going to be the last crisis. 
I mean, across East Africa now, there, there's a locust crisis that would need assistance to families there. Uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, beyond the Ebola crisis, they've had a measles crisis. In Nigeria, there has been a large Lassa fever outbreak. And so uh, this is a continent that's going to see a lot. And then finally, we are, as a continent in Africa, more vulnerable to climate change. We saw what happened in Mozambique because of Cyclone Idai. So having an architecture in place to be able to reach people, especially people in the informal sector, goes beyond simply responding to COVID-19. So 30 percent, yeah, that's what I'm asking for. Thank you. Thanks, Jude. Thank you. So the call for cash has been issued. Thank you very much to all of our comments. I think um, this has been a great conversation and has uh, laid out a clear call. First, that there, there's clear scope and capacity to expand um, cash transfers as a share of government budget, bank operations, aid programs, um, and as the part of the COVID-19 response uh, overall. Um, that many of the tools to implement remotely are already in place. There's certainly more to do. There are gaps, but there's plenty of scope to expand using the systems we have now that we need to act now, but also think long-term, that informality is structural, that it needs a safety net, and that that's the group that's vulnerable to entering uh, poverty, the, the dynamism in that uh, piece, that there are a number of implementation challenges. Uh, Joe talked about some of them, um, but there, that we can find solutions to deal with that. Um, and I particularly like the point about new partnerships to reach key and vulnerable populations that we wouldn't normally access through a government program, for example. Um, and then uh, Joe also asked us to change the default for philanthropy. Will this create a kind of new kind of cash transfer? Is it cash first and then see how we can improve on cash for that in-kind support that is being provided? Um, so with that, let's go to our online audience. Um, one question that came in was what should be or could be the role of bilateral donors? So those are... Uh, high-income country governments uh, that have their usual aid programs generally wrapped up in contractors and grantees, what would you hope to see from the bilateral funders? Um, maybe I'll start with uh, Laura and then uh, Joe and then um, uh, everyone else. Okay, so Laura, go ahead. What, what would you hope to see from bilateral funders? Um, well, I suppose one thing might be direct support to cash in order to extend at least some of the emergency emergency programs that are happening now, and perhaps then also, you know, providing support for the technical support to think about how we how we go further. I wonder as well, you know, what the appetite would be amongst bilateral donors to support some of the civil society platforms that are forming. Um, around the demand for cash, because I think, you know, I mean, we, we now have a lot of informal worker organizations who are allying with other groups in civil society to try and make demands of the government around cash. And I think that's really powerful because, I, you know, from the informal workers movement, we haven't necessarily seen that before. Um, and, and I do think that support to those kinds of widespread coalitions in, in pushing governments uh, to think further than, than the very narrow uh, poverty-targeted safety net uh, is important. Joe? Um, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, one, speed. Uh, I think uh, given the sort of speed of the economic sort of shutdown uh, over the world, it's pretty important that we respond quickly uh, to a kind of recognition of trade-offs that uh, if you want to respond quickly, if you want to meet, reach people you don't typically reach or people who uh, work in more informal sectors, uh, that involves maybe lower quality targeting, lower quality confidence in, in your targeting, but uh, is a trade for higher expected impact. And, and, and I think funders in general have to, to recognize that. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks, Joe. I would say we are uh, hoping to do a, an event with the U.S. Agency for International Development, or at least with panelists from USAID, to discuss whether cash programming could increase as a share of their operations. Um, and another mm -hmm. idea uh, that ex that uh, we've discussed with Ugo is uh, 
you know, a trust fund. There is a trust fund at the World Bank to support social protection programs. Uh, Ugo, can you tell us about the scope to increase uh, that uh, money from bilaterals or other sources? Oh, thank you, Amanda. I think in uh, in general, I mean, there are a number of roles that bilaterals uh, could play. Um, I, obviously, it would depend a little bit on the context where we are looking at fragile states or middle-income countries and a little bit the time frame now and over the next uh, year. But definitely uh, looking at, you know, the three points I laid out earlier on financing and institutions and, and delivery, I think there is a big role to play in all three. Um, as, the, as Jill said, on financing uh, part of the transfers, uh, on uh, um, helping to strengthen delivery capabilities across the delivery chain, uh, also, but also institutionally in terms of support for domestic resource uh, mobilization, um, and also in documenting uh, uh, innovations and uh, knowledge sharing. Um, there, is, uh, there is so much that's been, uh, that's been done and um, uh, I think documenting what's happening and, and sharing it, that's also an important part of it. And, um, and yeah, there are mechanisms to, to do that. Uh, and um, uh, one of them is indeed the trust fund that you, uh, that you, you mentioned, the Adapting Dynamic Social Protection Trust Fund. Um, but yeah, bilateral donors do have a number of roles to play across financing institutions and delivery. Um, let me, I'll go to you, Jude, but I also um, want to ask both Jude and Ugo a question that is, is there any available data showing what percentage of people in different countries in Sub-Saharan Africa can be reached in the near term with existing cash transfer mechanisms? So this goes to this question of, okay, we know the scale of the cash, some cash transfer programs now. What is that scope of increase uh, that exists? So, Jude, do you want to go first and, and also think about bilateral aid, and then we'll come back to you, uh, Ugo, and then maybe Laura? Sure. So just quickly, on that, I, I think, as uh, Ugo mentioned, in terms of the, most of the programs are really, really small and, and never really transition beyond, like, a pilot scale, in, uh, except maybe places like Kenya or South Africa. However, Nigeria found a very interesting way to go about this. Uh, the federal government announced yesterday that if a person purchases 100 naira uh, of airtime, that person is considered poor, if that's what they purchase consistently, and that person is going to get 5,000 naira transferred directly to them. So countries are able to find innovative ways of being able to target. It's less accurate in terms of targeting, but you're still able to reach a lot more people. So there are ways of being able to do that. Uh, in terms of uh, what bilaterals can do, I would say is developing the architecture for delivery, right? So if we decide that this is what we want to do and this is where we're going to go, then we want to be able to um, target people more accurately and be able to deliver that in terms of in, in, in <clears throat> when we need that. So I think that's one thing. The second thing is, and I'll go back to my point, is that hopefully there would not be a prolifer proliferation of parallel structures from bilaterals in terms of being able to do this, that in terms of acting, we're acting concert. I think that's one of the most useful things they can do now is to act in concert. Hugo? Um, I think it's, uh, it's hard to put a, a specific number, but let me, let me just say that um, if, uh, if we look at, if we take some of the uh, countries with uh, really low coverage and uh, we, we kind of say, well, let's get the coverage at least to the regional average, um, that would already, you know, uh, increase coverage by about 200 million people. If we say, you know, for country income groups, uh, among those that have lower coverage, take the coverage at least up to the average of uh, uh, your respective income group, that also would, you know, bring up, uh, based on preliminary analysis, about 400 million uh, people additionally. Of course, that, um, uh, you, you know, it depends on, uh, on the state of delivery mechanisms um, that uh, the work that uh, uh, CGD has been doing. Um, and uh, so based on that, you know, it, that would really determine, including also, you know, the financial capabilities, um, but uh, there is there is potential to scale up, um, and uh, and getting those delivery systems right, the institutions and financing would, would really expand the coverage frontier, um, hopefully soon. And I mean, in some ways, you know, if we think about South Africa 
uh, you know, the group that is not covered, of course, there's the extremely poor and these, um, spe these special or especially vulnerable groups that are hard to reach. But in general, that group that's that missing middle, they do have access to mobile money and mobile phones. And so, Laura, can you comment a little bit on that? How feasible would it be to cover that missing middle in South Africa, let's say? Let's think about it from a fiscal perspective, but also from an implementation perspective. So, I, I mean, I think South Africa is unlike the rest of Africa and perhaps more like Latin America in this respect, in that we have, you know, a fairly solid existing system of cash transfers. We have the child support grant, which goes out to 7 million um, people in the country um, to care providers and, and, a, and a fairly extensive old age pension um, for for the over 60s and I think both of those could be could be leveraged um, to to get into the informal economy um, I don't think it's going to cover everybody in the informal economy but we are waiting with bated breath for the government to make an announcement about what it's going to do is it going to extend the is it going to um, add to to the pension and the old child support grant and there's been some very interesting attempts to look at some of the national survey data and to, you know, often with survey data, it's quite difficult to get enough information from the household survey about labor force status. Um, and from the labor force survey data, there's not enough information about who's covered by a cash grant. So you have these two surveys not, not talking to each other. In South Africa, we have the National Income Dynamic Survey, which allows, allows for both of those things. And there's, there's been some very interesting um, data coming out of that. Um, which, show, which, which shows that adding a supplement to the child support grant um, would effectively reach a significant portion of informal workers who fall into the income deciles one and two, so the lowest income deciles. The figure is between four and 65%. It's, it's not clear to me which is the correct one yet. And there have been some claims that it will, will reach about 75% of women who have lost lost their incomes due to, to, the, to the regulation. So I think that there is significant scope um, to do that. It does leave out a large section of informal workers who are still not getting anything. And, and I think that there, there really is, you know, Namibia has just put in place a, a, a once-off grant which targets out. Um, so it targets out the people who are getting the supplement, targets out the formal workers. And, and I think that might, might perhaps also need to be a supplementary measure if we're really going to, to cover the informal workers. The, f the fiscal question is always the, the big one. And I mean, it's the, it's the reason why we're still sitting here in South Africa and we don't know what, <laughs> what the intervention is going to be. We, we have been in a recession before this. We're probably in a depression now. Um, large scale ten years of of corruption. Um, the questions around fiscal space are are important. I would ask though how constrained the fiscal space really is in South Africa. We do, the, you know, there are sort of creative places to look. Uh, we have a huge amount um, of reserves in the pension in the pension funds in South Africa, and and also we have an enormous surplus of over a hundred billion rand sitting in the unemployment insurance fund, um, which is collected over the years, and and some of that is definitely going to be apportioned. Uh, well, we don't know for sure, but definitely the government is thinking of taking some of that money and using it to fund some of these in immediate grants. The question is always, though, in the longer term, right? So if we're saying that informal incomes are, are not going to, to, are going to be disrupted for a longer term, how, how do we stretch that, that money out? Um, and they definitely are trade-offs, and they're very difficult decisions, decisions to make. Um, but I do think it's, it, it's important that fiscal, to, to understand that fiscal space may not be as constrained as it sometimes is presented as. Yeah. Well, I mean, it also signals the very complicated politics that are coming down the line and the hard choices that need to be made. Um, let's go uh, just related to some of the previous questions. But for Joe, um, we had a question that's, can you further detail how Give Directly has worked with telecom companies to identify the poor, e.g. by call volume or credit levels? And, and um, Jude referred to this uh, a case in Nigeria where they're doing targeting based on the amount of airtime people are buying. 
and how they may rely on churches or other non-governmentals to identify and register, register recipients of cash transfers. Um, in general, if, if the panel can think about what are some good examples or best practices for identifying beneficiaries during this time of remote work. So let's start with Joe. Thanks. Sure. Uh, I should say uh, the Nigerian government's ahead of us on the telco partnering front that uh, uh, I expect we'll get cash out for that, I don't know, in, in a month or so. But the concept here is, especially in countries that for which mobile money uh, or at least airtime purchases are very, very common, uh, you can use that transactional data uh, and you could, depending on the other data you could have, you could even train those sort of an algorithm sort of on that data on uh, Sort of hard truth income data, but if you don't have that, you can sort of make logical proxies around uh, what are the patterns of who's calling whom, what are the patterns of who's sending your time, the increments people are buying your time, the increments with, this, with which people are depositing or withdrawing from M-Pesa or a mobile money system. Uh, uh, and similarly, some of these payment platforms also have sort of debt over, overlays on that as well and savings products overlays as well, which would give you more information. Um, you know, I, I think the last few years have seen a kind of explosion in startups partnering with these types of telcos to create credit scoring products. Um, and I think the concept is very similar, but instead of uh, trying to predict credit worthiness, you're trying to predict vulnerability or poverty. Um, and, and so that's on the kind of telco front. On the partner front, uh, w what you want is um, ideally a partner who uh, either you can trust and so you can sort of go you know, at a governmental level or not, you could say, well, there's going to be 10 uh, unique tokens per church and every church can nominate 10 people or something like that. Um, I, I, that targeting mechanism, I think, is obviously very fraught, but you may decide it's your best option. Uh, otherwise, it's partners who have sort of deep knowledge of community data, ideally, that predates COVID-19, so it wasn't gathered originally for targeting, uh, which people could then consent to have shared for targeting, um, things like that. Uh, the last thing I'd say on targeting creativity as, uh, you know, options are constrained and you want to get cash out quickly is I do think there is a role for self or ideal targeting. Um, the kind of dumb version you could imagine is how long would a toll-free assessment call have to be for 50 cents a day uh, for, for you to be able to rule out the sort of richer people you don't want to give cash to and select uh, the sort of less wealthy people you do. Um, and I think there's different versions of, way you can, of ways you can make a, a sort of self-sign-up process or self-need-proof process uh, not uh, sort of overly burdensome, but sort of burdensome enough that uh, uh, the kind of self-filtering or self-selection uh, can enable you to get cash to people who need it. Um. We have a couple of other questions. We now have about 12 minutes left, so I'm going to go to each of you for your final words, starting with Jude. But I'll just flag a couple issues that have been raised on this on the thread so that you can consider it as part of your responses. So one was, um, Joe, you mentioned stress um, as uh, uh, one of the or mental health benefits from cash transfers. Uh, someone online is asking about that. Um, given that COVID-19 is having adverse impacts on mental health, um, what do we know about this ca cash transfers uh, as a tool in this uh, in the arsenal to respond to mental health issues or concerns? Um, there is a question about Latin America. So uh, Ugo and um, and Laura mentioned pro cash transfers in Colombia and Brazil. Uh, what's working and what's not in those examples? What other kinds of lessons could we draw for cash transfers? Um, finally, there's a question, speaking of our uh, last conversation about using cell phone, um, do they call it exhaust, sort of some of the outputs of cell phone purchasing information to identify people who are vulnerable. Um, someone asked about how do we address the data protection and privacy issues when we're using this kind of data for cash transfers. And to end, many things, this is so true in the health part as well, many things are unknown right now. But if you had to prioritize a few key research questions for investment in terms of what, what would we know about the impact of these cash transfers, what would they be? So let's start um, with Jude, then we'll do Laura, 
Joe, and we'll end with Ugo. So go ahead, Jude. So just quickly, in terms of how can we be more targeted in terms of doing this, so we, uh, Aubrey, Ruby, and I have a podcast called New Think, and on there we talk to a South African, it's out of Cape Town, a South African crowdsourcing platform called Zindi, and Zindi has about 10,000 registered data scientists from across the continent, and they're given data and they train AI to be able to determine patterns on this data. So there is a possibility here of being able to give the metadata that doesn't include um, particular information about, I, I, look, there are gonna be trade-offs here in terms of privacy and in terms of uh, our ability to be able to accurate, accurately and each society is gonna have to determine what those trade-offs is gonna be. We're gonna try to de design this as best as we possibly can. But we have tools now that did not exist 10 years ago that did not exist. So these um, crowdsourcing platforms, these um, uh, algorithms and machine learning that trains it to recognize patterns in data can actually help in terms of the targeting that we're trying to do. So I think it's important for us to be able to look, <clears throat> for us to be able to look at that. I think um, the, the kinds of questions that we're gonna be looking at now, uh, I mean, first is, you know, scale right and so what is the what is the best possible means of being able to reach as many people as possible as accurately as one possibly can and so we're going to find out because this we're going to come at this different countries are going to come at it at different ways and these are questions that we can be able to go back later look at the data to be able to because as i said we're going there are going to be other humanitarian crises that will require an outreach an outreach like this and using the best possible answers that we have will be necessary not just for this one but the one that comes after. But uh, it's been really great being out here, and uh, thank you, Amanda, for moderating. Thanks, Jude. Okay, uh, let's uh, now turn to Laura. Thanks, Amanda. And um, perhaps just a few comments on Latin America. I have to say that we've had our hands so full with just tracking the developments. We haven't yet got on to actually really an, doing an in-depth monitoring of what's working and what's not um, in the Latin American countries. What I, what I can say in Colombia, um, I think is the issue with, with the waste pickers that we've heard is that the grant is there, um, but people still don't want to leave the streets because they're worried about their market position being taken and usurped. And so I think that that issue of, you know, ensuring that the cash isn't taking the place of a li livelihood is important. Um, I think Peru has been a very interesting example because initially the first grant was um, only targeted at the very poor and and in rural areas. And then there was a lot of civil society push to say it's got to be for more than that because you're leaving out all of these urban informal workers. Um, and, and how they did it was by using a household um, survey, the social registry, it, they weren't necessarily targeting informal workers, but what they were doing was looking at the characteristics of many of the poorest informal workers, that they're women, that they have low levels of education, um, that they generally fall into the poorer quintiles, and using that as a way to get to informal workers. And, uh, you know, our team in Lima are quite optimistic that this will actually capture a lot of the most vulnerable, vulnerable workers. So I think that there's some really interesting examples coming out of Latin America in particular, but they are built on quite strong systems, um, underlying systems of social protection. Um, so it, you know, it, it may be different in Africa. I think I just wanted to leave off um, with the, the, the point that informal workers are unprotected, um, they are vulnerable, they're not unorganized though. There are organizations of workers in the informal economy and they are working very hard to try and ensure that, that protections are extended to informal workers. And, and I think that it's important to recognize that that work is being done and include those organizations in the policy processes um, as, they, as they move forward towards extending um, grants to the informal economy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. I totally agree with that. Uh, Joe, your final comments, and then we'll go to Ugo. Muted. Muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I just a really good point uh, that, that no one heard. No, I'm joking. But on, on the data privacy issues, I think you absolutely need to prioritize those and uh, take it really seriously, both on the kind of proactive uh, sort of informed consent fronts and also where data will be stored after the crisis. 
Um, and I think that's especially important for some of the most vulnerable folks who, uh, you know, in the U.S., we've ha had issues with uh, we don't necessarily want a, a registry of all the undocumented folks we've reached in, in the past or something like that. And, and there's analogs of that globally. Um, I'll touch on the, the research front and then end on stress. On the research front, uh, this is a place where GiveDirectly has not prioritized a lot of upfront, upfront research, despite otherwise being a very pro-research organization, because I do think there's a, pri a premium on speed today. Um, but I think we can be clever uh, in both in using existing already underway studies to better understand the effects of cash transfers, whether it's uh, our ongoing UBI study or other ongoing evaluations of recurring or one-time cash payments. And I think funding for those things and speedy setup of phone-based uh, surveying, uh, both quantitative and I think also qualitative, uh, will be super important. Um, on the kind of stress front, uh, and I'll end on that, um, I should say first off that uh, the special kind of stress that people are uh, feeling now, I think is relatively unique. And so uh, whether or not the kind of things we've seen in the rest of the research will uh, carry over to this, uh, I think remains to be seen. Uh, there are pretty well documented effects of cash transfers, lowering stress, lowering depression, improve, improving happiness. Um, and you've also seen it, especially uh, in some of the income shock work, not with GiveDirectly, uh, links between cash transfers and reductions of suicide. And so some of those would be the kind of questions I would look at for this pandemic. Um, and then related to that, uh, there is a large body of, or a large and kind of growing body of evidence on the effects of cash transfers and intimate partner violence. Uh, it is mixed uh, that there are examples where cash can, seems to increase intimate partner violence, but the balance of that evidence would suggest that it reduces it. And so um, that would be my, my, my bet here as well. So I, I think whether that plays out will be important to see. Uh, and with that, thank you guys so much for having me. It's been great joining you from my living room. <laughs> thank you so much, Joe. And um, actually, before COVID happened, I was thinking about a cash transfer for gender equality. But in any case, needs must. We've changed focus. So, Ugo, can, can you, uh, so many questions for you. Uh, tell us what to do next. Thanks. <laughs> um, well, I also echo Joe's, Josh's point. Uh, great, uh, great pleasure uh, having joined you. Um, look, Amanda, we, we got into this uh, pandemic with a very strong evidence base on cash transfers, as you said, on human capital, on resilience, economic inclusion, multipliers, gender, crisis preparedness and response. I think that in part because of that, at least in part, um, we see cash transfers now as a premier vehicle for response. Um, I think that moving forward, that's going to be more and more that the case, uh, having cash some, some sort of a default response in crisis. Uh, and is also shedding light actually now of the cost of not having it. And um, um, that tells me um, really about the importance of the capabilities of having cash transfers, having strong delivery systems in place. There can be a lot of debate on the duration of transfers, uh, their size, whether to reach everyone or some or combinations thereof, but the underlying capabilities that allow governments to make those choices and you know, reach out to as many people as possible are, are really important. So um, that's, that's going to be another key area. But then also how we leverage this experience to uh, tackle some longstanding issues in a transformative way. Um, we all uh, discussed informal workers, uh, um, urban areas, uh, the, the importance of scalable systems. And this is not something that cash transfers can do by themselves. Um, there's going to be a lot of uh, intersectoral work that goes into it, a um, uh, lot of linkages with, with different sectors, uh, different services, different livelihood interventions. So the more also we move forward, the more the integration with other interventions is going to be key. Thank you to everyone who joined today. Uh, we, I think this was a really good conversation and we could have some more. Maybe all of us could commit to coming back in two months and seeing where we've gotten to, what progress has been made, what we're learning. Um, 
But uh, I think we'll end there right on time. Thank you so much to the online audience for, for your interest in this issue and for joining us today. So thank, thanks so much, everyone. Bye.